Hello, Internet. I'm Jesse, your comrade ferret, and I was going to wait to do this episode until my videos sucked a little less. But I've been playing this game again recently, and I feel almost obliged to bring it up sooner rather than later. So I'm going to plug it, squee about it for the next few minutes, wave my arms around a little bit, and tell you why it's so important to me that I'm willing to spend days making a video about it. The game is Tooth and Tail by Pocket Watch Games. It's a real-time strategy, think StarCraft and Age of Empires, that came out in 2017 and boasts a uniquely simple playstyle that emphasizes strategy over actions per minute while still being incredibly fast-paced and bringing a lot of depth in its variety of units and strategies. A ton of love went into it from this indie studio from the gorgeous art, to the beautiful music by Austin Wintory, to the excellently accomplished cipher used to give the characters of the game what sounds to be their own Slavic language, in which is written, I kid you not, straight up revolution songs. The plot revolves around the notion of these sapient animals eating one another, as animals do, and the eternal question of who gets the meat and who gets to be the meat. The nation's leader, the Tsarina, has been mysteriously assassinated, and now all-out war has broken out between four factions. You've got the Longcoats, who are these free market revolutionaries and believe that those who worked hard are able to pull themselves up by the bootstraps should feed on those who cannot. You've got the common folk who are anarchists and want the cannibalized people to be chosen democratically. There's the civilized who are a theocratic oligarchy holding onto power and represent a corrupt lottery system. And finally, the KSR, who are authoritarian and are primarily fighting merely for peace in whatever form it comes in order to reassert control over the population. You can see where all this is going. The game's plot is absolutely oozing metaphors applicable to the real socioeconomic world, both historically and in regards to the present day. And Beyond being furry enough and revolutionarily styled enough to merit a mention or a meme or two on this channel, it's the politics that make it worth giving its own video. Now, from here on in, there will be spoilers. This game has an amazing story and a wonderful twist, so if you haven't played it yet, hey, you don't need to watch this. Grab the game when it's on sale and come back and we can talk about it. Alright, so let's talk about the long coats first. They're led by this Teddy Roosevelt-looking rat magnate named Arroyo Bellafeed. If you watch trailers of the game, he's sort of presented as the de facto protagonist. You play as him first, and unlike the other four commanders, you're actually given a little backstory for him. Under the lottery system of the civilized, he lost his young son to the kitchen. Conversely, though, we also probably see the least amount of his actual beliefs compared to the other commanders. Talking to your fellow longcoats reveals certainly that he wants his people to work harder, and you get a little glimpse into the shadiness of his revolution in that it primarily is funded from the production and sale of Orn, a strong acorn-based alcohol that seems to also have some dissociative effects given its impact on the troops and its addictive qualities. But you have to actually dig a little to get Bellafeed to admit what he truly wants. It isn't what Hopper thinks he wants. Hopper, as the charismatic de facto leader of the common folk, wants a democratic system and believes that she and Bellafeed as allies at the beginning of the story will establish it together upon the completion of the revolution. She 
does not realize that although Belafide talks about the creation of a fair system, what he actually desires is a system in which the individuals he sees as weak or less productive will be eaten by those who are strong and more capable of working in his capitalist society. And I think this is the actual reason, whether explicit or not, that the game's writers decided to give us so much more backstory into Belafide than the other major characters. He is not the game's protagonist, although it initially looks like he might be, but his ideals are, quite arguably, the most brutal and sinister of them all. He's funding a civil war he started through the production of drugs so that he can establish, uniquely among the four factions, an explicitly, intentionally unequal society. So right off the bat we have this massive and very real, very topical irony. The Democrats, the true believers in equality and freedom, allying themselves completely unknowingly to an outright supremacist. This should sound familiar to anyone who's heard rhetoric from the right wing of the United States politics. Which, let's be honest, is all United States politics. However, it doesn't stop there with the common folk. By the end of Hopper's campaign, you become acutely aware of her own moral bankruptcy. While she commands the least amount of authority of any of the commanders, truly just being a charismatic figure that the common folk rally around willingly, she has no qualms with lying, cheating, and stealing in order to keep opinions of her high. She stages raids on the longcoats while still allied with them and still completely intent on maintaining her alliance with them. Furthermore, behind the scenes, she actually takes orders from the mob matriarch who is the real mastermind behind the military and organizational efforts of the revolution. And that story we're given of Hopper amputating her own arm to selflessly feed the starving population? If you seek out a certain well-hidden NPC, they accuse her of actually removing it in order to feed herself, something which she does not deny. Right, on to the Quartermaster, the only commander without a name. She does not represent a person, she represents an idea. Or better yet, a system. Throughout the first half of the game, she's painted as the big bad, and it's easy to do. She operates out of a giant concrete bunker literally called The Kitchens, and is the head of the state's secret police with a menacing KGB-inspired acronym for a name, which incidentally, no one knows what the KSR stands for. All we know, until we actually get to play as her, is that the Quartermaster is the main individual who is standing in the way of a successful revolution of the people. So as any good writer will have it, now we get to see the irony swing the other way. The Quartermaster has no personal qualms with the revolution or even its ideals. What she truly loathes is how willing the longcoats and the common folk are to end lives unnecessarily, not for food, but purely for their ideals. All the Quartermaster wants is peace, in whichever way it may come. I personally found it very easy to be taken in with her ideals. Maybe I have a bit of an authoritarian streak. But as time goes on, although she keeps her cool well and holds to her ideal of peace, it becomes clear that the Quartermaster doesn't actually believe that it can happen. A common phrase she states during games from her book of rules is a rule number one, conflict is inevitable. When Kasha the Fox approaches the quartermaster to suggest that hostilities may be de-escalating and that the KSR should consider declaring a ceasefire, the quartermaster declines, calling it a daydream. If the common folk believe a little too much in their cause, to the point of not seeing its faults, the quartermaster believes too little. She will keep moving, inexorably like a machine, until everyone capable of waging war is dead. Now, if Belafide is the master of deceiving others, and the common folk are master of belief in that deception, and the quartermaster is the master of refusal to distinguish between the two, Archimedes, the second-in-command and field commander of the civilized, is the master of self-deception. 
I find this faction fascinating, as the belief system upon which they're based, the path of the sun and the path of the tree, remind me very strongly of the beliefs of many pre-colonial Mesoamerican peoples. Let's talk about this real-world example for a moment. When we think of, say, Nahua religion, the religion of the people commonly known as the Aztecs today, the first thing we think of is, of course, human sacrifice. We imagine people being hauled off of battlefields or out of prison, kicking and screaming to have their hearts torn out in front of a crowd, cheering the fact that it isn't them. But this isn't how it was. Human sacrifice was a celebrated part of life by all members of society, and indeed, people believed it to be an honor and often volunteered to be brutally and painfully murdered in front of their families. Two kings of the era, Quetzalcoatl of the Toltecs and Nezahuacoyotl of the Aztecs, actually tried to outlaw human sacrifice, but met so much resistance from the lower classes that they were unable to. Likewise, in Tooth and Tail, back to the civilized, the path of the sun, the path in which these animals are sacrificed, is considered sacred, honorable. Before being sacrificed, these animals are celebrated, given a plush bed, warm sheets, strong drugs. And truly, by the time you're finished the campaign, if you're like me and you're drinking in every bit of story that you can before the end, it's almost understandable that these characters would prefer to be slaughtered. They just want a little comfort. They want their life to have meaning. They want faith. And Sage Morrow, the supposedly impartial decider in the lottery system, can give them that. It harkens a little to Marx's anecdote that religion is the opiate of the masses. And it's more complicated than most people understand when they hear that oft-recited phrase. I'll perhaps return one day to do a whole video on religion and Marxism, but I think plenty is illustrated right here in Tooth and Tail. The religion itself is not the problem, but it is a symptom. People turn to it largely towards the end of the war, when the conflict and resulting starvation has taken everything else away from them. Ideals are lost. Even the desire for peace is lost. Even their will to remain in this world is lost. All many of them want is, in some way, to live on. And Sage Morrow preys on this. He uses this feeling of defeat to crush opposition in hopes of re-establishing his theocracy, even in spite of Archimedes' own protests. When informed that the other three factions actually did what Kasha said would happen and signed a ceasefire in order to live peacefully and rebuild in Snickery, Snage Morrow has Archimedes go there and raise the place to the ground. By this time, it looks like the civilized will win in the end. The analogs to the White Army and the Rush Revolution, those who want the old ways and to, if anything, strengthen the monarchy and the role of social classes, will be the victors. Because when a populace is tired, that's where we turn to. It's hard to look forward, and it's easy to look back. All these animals, well, they're looking back. Even the pigs have informed Archimedes that a final push is all that's needed to completely wipe out the rest of the resistance in Vieshal. And then, they're all destroyed. And this is the real revolution of the game. Belafide's capitalist uprising is a farce. And we know that by the time we reach the skirts with Hopper. And Hopper's disorganized and ultimately selfish revolt is little better in the end. We already see the mob conspiring to game the democratic system in order to gain power for the majority at the expense of the minority. Every one of these four factions is predatory to the point that it's likely that even we, the player, have taken sides, have chosen a lesser evil to root for and have forgotten actually how horrible the whole basis of it is. We've forgotten who we've been butchering the entire game as our primary resource. The pigs. And the pigs murdered the Tsarina, overthrew the system, orchestrated this giant civil war between the powers that be, so that in the end, they can be free from a system in which 
one class preys upon another. And they don't do it by half measures. They don't manipulate a pact between the factions. They don't hold an election or negotiate for power. They storm Noe District and destroy every last grist mill, killing anyone who stands in their way. And we, the player, are met with relief. Chances are, when you first played this final mission, you lost horribly. You played as every faction one by one, and four times in rapid succession, you were defeated. And by the end of it, you probably did what I did. You took your hands off your controller and said, Okay, do it. It's about time. This is fantastic. And I know all this is allegory, but this is how we need to treat the revolution in the real world too. Because all of this is happening right now. We have capitalists who are cooking up fascism in our backyard. We have Democrats unknowingly but militantly supporting them. We have authoritarians who wish to seize power for themselves, and we have oligarchs who are perfectly happy to take advantage of the resulting suffering. You and I, we're not the common folk. We're not the KSR. We're the goddamn pigs, and we should be cheering on every gristmill that falls. And that's the end of my discussion on Tooth and Tail. Wow, this wound up being a lot longer than I imagined it would. Maybe I should solicit an endorsement from Pocket Watch Games, huh? Anyway, if you haven't played it yet, Tooth and Tail often goes on sale for like three bucks. Even though I just spoiled the plot for you, if you're a strategy fan, you owe it to yourself to give it a go. And if I entertained you, or got you excited to check out the game, or heck, maybe I gave you a new way to look at the concept of revolution, give me a like, give me a sub. I always forget to myself, so it's okay if you do too. Bye now.